Hola, bienvenidos. My name is Rosie Chinez Shaver, and I'm the Executive Director of the Catholic Association for Latino Leadership. Thank you for join, joining us this Advent season to journey with Ka and Mary on a three-part series on Hispanic Marian apparitions. Tonight, Father Marcos Gonzalez, a call chaplain who is the pastor at St. Andrew's Catholic Church in South Pasadena, California, will speak on the apparition in Cuba, Our Lady of Charity, Nuestra Señora de la Caridad del Cobre. Little known fact, I'm a Cuban and Puerto Rican. When I was in Miami um, a few years ago with another Cuban friend and also a friend of call, Carlos de Queseda, for a meeting, we went to the chapel in Miami of Our Lady of Charity. It was beautiful, and I recommend it to anybody that's in the Miami area to go and check it out. As we begin all good things, I'm going to lead us in an opening prayer. This is an abbreviated prayer from St. John Paul II. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Virgin of Charity of El Cobre, patroness of Cuba, you're the beloved daughter of the Father, the mother of Christ, our God, the living temple of the Holy Spirit. Your very name, Virgin of Charity, reminds us that God is love, reminds us of the new commandment of Jesus, calling forth the Holy Spirit, love poured out in our hearts, the fire of charity sent down on Pentecost on the church, gift of the full liberty of the sons of God. Increase our faith, enliven our hope, strengthen and increase our love, protect our families, protect our youth and children, console those who are suffering, be our model and the star of the new evangelization. Gather together your people scattered throughout the world. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now I'd like to introduce our guest, Father Marcos Gonzalez. Father Gonzalez was born in 1962 in Havana, Cuba. When he was nine years old, his family came from Cuba during the last of the freedom fights on October 13th, 1971, and settled in the Atwater village of Los Angeles. After high school, he entered St. John's Seminary College in Camarillo, where he graduated in 1985 with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Father's first parish assignment was St. Mary's St. Mary Magdalene in Camarillo, which is a beautiful parish. I've been there a few times. He has ministered at St. Monica Academy, Holy Family in Glendale, St. John Christendom Parish in Inglewood, and St. Andrew's Parish in Pasadena. He continues to serve as pastor today at St. Andrew's Parish. He serves the Cuban community in Los Angeles, is vice president of the California Association of Natural Family Planning, spiritual director of the Familia Portiar de las Americas, which teaches natural family planning to engage in married couples, serves on the commission on Catholic life issues in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, is district priest of District 5 of Catholic Engaged Encounter, was elected to be the priest on the national executive team for Catholic Engaged Encounter, serves the Order of Lazarus of Jerusalem as commander of the Grand Commandery, enjoys the rank of Knight Commander in the Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, and is a founding member of the Los Angeles chapter of the Confraternity of Catholic Clergy. In 2011, he was appointed by Archbishop Jose Gomez as the founding chaplain of the Catholic Association for Latino Leadership in their Los Angeles chapter. In his spare time, he enjoys attending the performances of the Los Angeles Opera, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, I'm sorry, the orchestra, <laughs> and, the, and the Hollywood Bowl where they, when they are in season. Without further ado, ado, let's hand it over to Father Marcos. Good evening, Rosie, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. Much too long, but it is fine. So I appreciate it very much. I want to tell you a little bit first about myself, other than what Rosie said regarding the faith. Um, it wasn't in including the biography, but my, I've been a Catholic my entire life. I was baptized just a week after I was born. I only discovered that later on when I entered the seminary and had to find my certificate of baptism. But because I was born in 1962, in fact, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was a time in which the churches of Cuba were almost all closed. Um, the faith was not practiced except by the elderly and just a few people in certain towns, but overall it was not being practiced. So I grew up basically without the liturgical life of the church until I came to the United States in 1971, as Rosie said. 
the my early part of the early part of my life, my religiosity really was a home religiosity. And very prominent in our tiny little house was the statue of Our Lady of Charity. It was the traditional one that you'll see in a few moments in the image of her in the in the blue dress with the little boat in front of her with the three boys that are rowing in the boat. And I would see that every single day of my life. I never really knew anything about it. In fact, I don't recall ever anybody explaining to me what it meant. But I do recall that she would watch over us. We would say our prayers there. And it was an image that simply implanted since the earliest memories in my mind. The only time I remember ever going to a church as a child was to another shrine of another one of these small little uh, Marian images of Nuestra Señora de la Regla, Our Lady of the Rule. It was talking about the Augustinian Rule. And this was very similar to Our Lady of Charity, except that that image is black. She's an African uh, image and she comes from Spain. And the only reason we went there is because that particular shrine was close to our home. We'd go on the bay, cross a little and throw a boat, go over. And my mother would take us, uh, maybe I remember going there maybe two or three times as a child. So we were taught about Nuestra Señora de la Regla. So that's the only Marian piety that I had in my infancy, in my early childhood was this image of Our Lady of Charity in our home, visiting the shrine of Our Lady of La Regla in, uh, in Havana, in the Havana Harbor. And then it was not until I came to the United States that I started to actually have a life, of, a liturgical life of the church through an invitation uh, of the next door neighbor. We moved into our home in early 1973. She simply invited us to mass and my brother and I, and so we went. And before you knew it, we were going to mass all the time. And eventually she instructed us in the catechism and we made our first communion confirmation. And later on, my brother and I became altar boys and the rest is history as I went to Catholic schools and then later on into the seminary in 1981. And I was ordained in 1994 by uh, His Eminence Cardinal Mahoney as the last ordination class in the old cathedral of St. Viviana in downtown Los Angeles. So now the history with Our Lady of Charity. As I mentioned to you, I didn't really know an awful lot about her until much later. So when I entered the seminary, I always had the little holy cards of Our Lady of Charity. So at some point I wanted to know, you know, what about her? Because even though I'm Cuban, I never really was taught anything about her. So I did a little bit of research on her and so forth, and I grew to have a devotion to Our Lady. So I would always have her holy card in my breviary. But an interesting thing happened in 19, um, I think it was 1980s, sometime in the 1980s, late 80s, Cardinal Mahoney asked me to, we, we were all supposed to go for a Spanish immersion uh, to learn Spanish at that time in the seminary. So when it came to my time to go, everybody knew I already spoke Spanish fluently. So it would have been a waste to send me to, most of them went to Guatemala or Mexico to learn Spanish. So I talked to the Cardinal and I said, you know, I already speak Spanish, but I would like to have a different kind of a pastoral experience. I would love to be able to spend my summer, which instead of studying Spanish, which I already know, to really study the Cuban culture and religiosity. And for that, I would like to go to Miami, to the shrine of Our Lady of Charity in Miami that Rosie just talked about. I knew of Bishop, um, uh, uh, Bishop Agustin Roman, who was the exiled uh, the, the exiled priests of Cuba, there was 131 of them, including the auxiliary bishop of Cuba, who, of Havana, who were ex expelled in 1961, right after the, um, the pigs invasion. So Bishop Roman eventually became a priest. He was already a priest in Cuba. He was expelled. He went to uh, Venezuela and ended up in Miami. And as a priest in Miami, it was his particular duty to look after the Cuban people there, especially the early refugees, of which I was one, but in California. So he always, he started a little shrine. He wanted to build a little shrine to Our Lady of Charity. And eventually that little shrine now is a national shrine. It's still very humble, just very small. It's in the image of her vesture, it's like a little cone. And people go there every single day, hundreds and hundreds, and of course, thousands at her feast day. So I spent a summer there. And it was really there that my devotion to Our Lady of Charity grew, as well as my uh, knowing about her. So that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about her today. With all that background, 
if you go back in time, we know from our uh, elementary school days that Columbus came in 1492. He came first to the Dominican Republic, but very shortly after, just a few days later, he went to Cuba. So that would be the beginning of Christianity in Cuba with the arrival of Columbus. But it was not until 1512, a few years later, that the first official missionary went to establish a church there. And that's considered to be the official foundation of the Catholic Church in Cuba. The early evangelization, as throughout Latin America, was difficult. The, uh, the Indians uh, initially rejected Christianity, or they were simply indifferent to it. Uh, the, the early Spaniards that came were people who had their faith, but they found it hard to practice in this very savage land that they were in. So a variety of devotions began. But if you look throughout the 16th century, throughout Latin America, you'll see that there are a variety of marrying apparitions. The most important one, of course, is Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, which we're going to be celebrating just a short time, uh, a few days in December the 12th. It's almost as if the Blessed Mother took it upon herself to evangelize this new continent. Because throughout Latin America, you'll find a variety of Marian images that appeared seemingly in a supernatural way where, where the evangelization had gone very slowly and very difficult, now Our Lady takes over. And once she appears, the evangelization is just on fire. We saw that in Mexico, we saw it in Cuba. We see it all throughout Latin America. The particular apparition in Cuba takes place in the year 1612, although some historians say it may have been a little bit early. And it took place in the most Eastern part of Cuba, in the province of Santiago, Santiago de Cuba, which is on the far, far eastern side, is the largest province on the far eastern side, in the little town called El Cobre. El Cobre means, Cobre means copper. And it's a tiny little mining town. But in that little town, one day, three boys went out to find salt in the sea. It was common in those days, the only preservative used was uh, sea salt. And so they went out and their names were Juan, Juan, and Rodrigo. Interestingly, over time, it became known as the Three Juanas. Even Rodrigo changed his name, or uh, they changed it for him. It became all three Johns, three Juanas. Two of them were uh, of mixed blood, most likely Indian and maybe Spanish, and one was black. Little, uh, little Juan de Dios was, was black. And it's interesting that he had the only Marian medal that was pinned to his, to his uh, shirt. They go out in the sea, and the sea was calm that day, and they're out mining salt, but then a storm brews up. And in the storm, their little boat is about to tip over. And so they start praying. They start praying the Hail Marys, the prayers that they know. And in the midst of this, then the, they hear birds and the sea calms down. And then in the distance, they see what they think is a white bird, perhaps a pigeon or some sort of a, a seabird, a seagull or something like that. So they get closer and closer, and as they get closer to it, they find out that it is not a bird at all. It is a little bundle, which has a small statue, 16 inches tall, and she is standing on top of a piece of wood that is floating in the sea, and she's holding in one hand a baby Jesus, and in the other hand a cross. It's the only apparition that we see of Our Lady where she's holding the child Jesus and holding the cross in the other hand. And engraved in the little wooden uh, platform is, are the words, Yo soy la Virgen de la Caridad. I am the Virgin of Charity. So they're fascinated by this. They take the image onto the boat. They go back to shore. And they excitedly tell the people in the village about this. The people decide, one of the officials, there was no priest there. So one of the officials decides that they should make a chapel to her in the bigger town, which is next door, but how? So they make a little chapel there. But shortly after that, she disappears. And they look all over. There's a search party all over to find her. But they find her back over where they had discovered her, but they see. And her clothes are now wet once again. They bring her back to the little chapel. They dry her off. They put her back in the shrine. And soon after, she disappears again. This happened three times. So they realize, obviously, she does not want to be in that little chapel in that town. 
they decide they must go back, back to the town where she was found in El Cobre. And then at night, one of the nights, they see this great shining light in the middle of the forest on the hill. And so by that time, they had consulted the priest, and the priest says, well, this is where we should build the ch first church, the first chapel of Our Lady. And she has been there ever since. So in the Bahia de Nipe, where the, 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 the first bay where she was discovered, there's the little town of El Cobre, and above El Cobre, the copper town, is this little hill, and on top of that little hill is where the first chapel was erected. And of course, that's where the Basilica of Our Lady of Charity is today. But of course, now today, it's a much bigger church. It was built back in the 1800s, beautiful, beautiful church. I was able to be there about, I think it was about 10 years ago that I was able to make a pilgrimage there. Now, what happens after that? Once people learn about this miraculous image, they start going there in pilgrimages. And they start praying. And if you go to the shrine now, you will see a variety of um, crutches and, and other symbols of people who have been cured there. So miracles start to take place. And as the miracles start to take place, greater and greater devotion grew. And this devotion then it became eventually a, a, a national phenomenon where everybody in Cuba knew about Nuestra Señora de la, la Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, Our Lady, who is the Virgin of Charity, and devotion to her group. The original statue is still there, and it is very high above the, the altar, enclosed in glass, and she has a variety of uh, garments. Sometimes she's in white, most of the time she's in gold. I'll ask um, uh, the, our, our Edgar to put up the image. That's the image, that's the original image of Our Lady of Charity. You'll notice several things about it. First of all, she obviously over time has the, the vesture has become much more ornamented. They've added the beautiful halos in the back with precious jewels. And you notice that there are two little crowns, the crown of Our Lady and then the crown of baby Jesus. Those crowns came about a little bit later because in the original, um, the original image did not have the crown. The crown is a, is a result of a petition given to the Pope to name her as the Queen of Cuba. Let's go back to the original image, if, if you could put back the, um, the first image. If you look at the first image, that's the image that is in the popular mind of the typical Cuban. That was the image that I had it, uh, made of plaster in my home as a child. It shows the Blessed Mother floating on the, in, the, in the skies, two angels above, and then the title, Yo Soy La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, and you see the boys in the, in the ship, in the boat, desperately trying to calm down. You see Juan de Dios, the middle one, the black child, who is praying. The others are praying as well, but they're trying to row the boat. That image is really the image of the popular mentality. What happened on that day in 1612 when they were in the, in the boat in the storm? But the original image, if we go back to it now, is, is that small little plaster statue that we see. That's the original image of Our Lady of Charity. Now, there's also politics that are part of this as well. Remember that Cuba was a Spanish colony for, from its foundation until the year 1902. In 1902, it became a republic. But before that, there was a long period of a battle for independence. And so a variety of the Cuban patriots asked Our Lady for her intercession in the freedom of Cuba. In fact, it was in... 1868, that Carlos Manuel de Cespedes was considered the father of the country, much like we would consider George Washington, the father of the United States, the father of our country. Carlos Manuel de Cespedes is the father of the nation of Cuba. He was the first one who began the revolutionary movement for independence. He was joined by a variety of other people. Well, one of the things that he did is he took the entire troop to the Shrine of Our Lady in, um, in Oriente, in El Cobre, and there prostrated himself and begged her for eventually having the freedom of Cuba. Together with him, there's several very important people that were prostrated before that image. Pedro Figueredo, who was the author of the uh, national anthem of Cuba, the Himno de Bayamón. Francisco Vicente Aguilera, Calixto Garcia, Máximo Gómez, Donato Marmo, and Commandant Rosendo Arteaga. Rosendo Arteaga would be pivotal because he was the father of the first Cuban cardinal, Cardinal Manuel Arteaga in Betancourt. 
So we see these very pivotal patriotic figures. It's as if we were to say all the founding fathers of the United States going over to the Shrine of Our Lady. That's exactly what happened in Cuba. The founding fathers of Cuba all went to the Shrine of Our Lady. They prostrated themselves there. They did her homage and they begged for her intercession. Now the battles continued, a variety of battles that culminated in the famous battle between uh, of the Spanish-American War in 1898. When that happened, which took place in the harbor of Havana, when the, the main was bombed, um, that ended the power of Spain over Cuba. No longer was it going to be a Spanish colony. Now it became a protectorate of the United States, much like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico continued on as a commonwealth, but Cuba in 1902 was granted independence and it became an independent republic. It was precisely in that year that the leaders of Cuba went to His Holiness, Pope Benedict XV in Rome, and they asked that Cuba, uh, that Cuba be dedicated to the uh, patronage of Our Lady of Charity. So in 1915, Pope Pius the, the, uh, Pope Pius the excuse me, Pope Benedict XV um, declared Our Lady of Charity to be the patroness of Cuba. At that time then, this brought about a complete union of or unity throughout the night and nation of everyone coming unto this beautiful patronage. And so a solemn mass was held. And then later on, they would ask in 1936, the Holy Father at that time declared it to be queen of Cuba. And so there was a huge um, solemn mass, which uh, involved all the, all the Cuban bishops, and she was solemnly crowned. That's why you see in the image the little crown on top of her head and the crown on the image of the child Jesus as well. Both images then became venerated throughout Cuba under those, those crowns. In May of 1951, on the 20th of May, which is the Independence Day, the pilgrim statue, uh, there are two statues, the original one, then there's an exact replica, which is what's called the pilgrim when she goes out to visit uh, the, the whole various shrines throughout the country. It was sent out and she would leave the National Sanctuary of El Cobre and she would go throughout the country. Cardinal Artiaga, who was the Archbishop at the time said, she'll go to the cities, to the campsites, to the churches, to the homes, to the hospitals, to the jails, to the farms, everywhere she would go. And so it began a huge national evangelization movement throughout 1951 where many more people began to practice the faith. She became once again, the great evangelizer of Cuba. Now, in 1959, there was a Eucharistic Congress, in, a national Congress in Cuba that began in 28th of November, 1959. If you know your history, you know that it was precisely that same year, January 1st, 1959, that the communist revolution triumphed in Cuba. And so in that year, which was really the last year of uh, any kind of religious freedom in Cuba post-communist -re post, uh, revolution, there was that great national Congress. And the Blessed Mother once again made her, uh, her, her, her per, per, uh, pilgrimage throughout the country for devotion. Ironically, it was just shortly after that that the communist government began its great persecution of the church, eventually pretty much shutting the church down almost entirely. They never dared to touch the national shrine of Our Lady of Charity. It's interesting, that church was never closed. They knew that they could not touch that image. In fact, ironically and, and very uh, hypocritically, when Castro entered Havana after the triumph of the revolution, he had in the front of his military car, a statue of Our Lady of Charity. They wanted to tell the people, we are just as Catholic as you are, so that the people would trust them, would they not, uh, would not uh, fear them, and so forth. And of course, that was all hypocrisy, because they, they, had, they had no faith or devotion whatsoever. On the contrary, they, they greatly persecuted the church. So then you see another thing take place. In 1961, after the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion, they, they became a tremendous crisis of the church in Cuba. That's when the persecution was 
in full frontal mode. So 130 priests were rounded up viciously throughout all the churches of Cuba. They were rounded up in the middle of the night. Sometimes when they were saying mass, others roused out, out of bed. Whatever clothes they were on, they all had their cassocks on. Some of them, that's the only thing they had. They had no ID, no passports, nothing, nothing. They were rounded up and they were taken to Havana, to the port of Havana, to a Spanish uh, vessel, a Spanish a ship called the Covadonga that had been uh, docked there. And then they were simply marched on board to be expelled. They had no permission from Spain to do that. It was a Spanish ship. They had no permission from the captain to do that. There was no room for them. All the cabins were already sold out. So what happened is they were simply marched in. They had to go into the holes, into the hull of the ship and down there in the, uh, in the pantries and so forth of the ship, they had to, they were given sheets and, and blankets and, and that's, where they, uh, that's where they had to sleep. As they were watching the, all these priests going in, the last one on board was Bishop Masvidal. Bishop Masvidal, Bosa Masvidal was the auxiliary bishop of Havana. And he was the pastor of the Church of Our Lady of Charity in Havana, which is the local shrine there. He was the last one marched with a gun to his back onto that ship. I tell you that story because that begins another chapter in the devotion to Our Lady of Charity and in the Cuban experience. Those 130 priests plus uh, Bishop uh, Eduardo Bosa Masvidal were then shipped off to Spain. They arrived there with nothing. Thanks be to God, the Spanish government um, welcomed them and they, they were settled and gave them uh, identification papers and so forth. Um, as I said, there was no room for them uh, in, on the ship, no room for the bishop even. The captain of the ship actually gave his, his bunk, his bed to the bishop for that long journey across the Atlantic. When they, they were settled throughout Latin America, many of them stayed in Spain. Uh, some went to Venezuela, Bishop Banfidal went to Venezuela. Bishop Roman, who was a, simply a, a priest at that time, Agustin Roman, he and several others, most of them in fact, went to Miami. In Miami, they found a Cuban community that was traumatized. These were the people who had either been expelled or who left on their own once they realized that the communists had taken over, they lost their properties, they lost their businesses. They were basically people who just felt completely, uh, just uh, in Spanish, we, we say the word desamparados, which means without any protection. The bishop decided we need to preserve our faith. We need to preserve our traditions. So he began to a collect, little collection. And he personally told me when I was there in the late eighties that the chapel was built by the cents, by the dimes, the nickels, and the pennies of the refugees of Miami. And bit by bit, he built that little shrine and it became a, a place of faith, of unity, of patriotism for the Cubans in exile. So now you have two Cuban communities. Eventually, a little statue was smuggled out of Cuba, which was an exact replica of the one of Our Lady of Charity in El Cobre. This little statue was smuggled out and was taken to the shrine of Our Lady of Charity and she's still there. And there's duplicates of her that go out. In fact, we had her here in Los Angeles just a few years ago. So now you have the original image of Our Lady of Charity in El Cobre in the Basilica. And then you have this additional one, which is an exact replica, which is also a pilgrim statue because as Our Lady of Charity accompanied the Cubans in Cuba during uh, all those 400 years, before um, uh, the, the Cuban national history, now she is also there present in exile. And she is there uh, to shelter the Cubans of Miami as well. It's very interesting that throughout the history of Latin America in the 16th century, you see these various little figurines. You see in Nuestra Señora de Suyapa, for example, in Honduras. You see in Mexico, Nuestra Señora de San Juan de los Lagos, also a tiny little figurine. We don't know the origin of these figures, of these little statues. Most likely they came from Spain. But interesting, they all have some sort of miraculous apparition. Not a single one of them was ever sold in a store or brought by a priest to a church. They all had a miraculous apparition, whether at sea, in the forest, wherever it may be. But they had incredible power of compelling faith. And so even in our own day, they still do. 
many people will look at the little image of Our Lady of Charity and wonder, you know, what is that all about? What is she, what, is, what does it mean? And why is she holding this image of the child Jesus and this cross? Our Lady is an evangelizer. She always wishes to join herself to our Lord. Everything that Jesus wants is what Mary wants. And so she, she very naturally, wants people to know her, her, her son, the savior of the world. So therefore she appears to a variety of people throughout the world in all a variety of different titles and, um, and names. And of course, that's natural for us. We love our mothers. We call our mothers by different names mother, mama, mommy, uh, whatever it may be, different cultures have different names. Same thing with the, with our, uh, the family of God. We call Mary, it's the same person, the mother of Jesus, but we call her by different titles and different beautiful um, images that she has. The particular one of Our Lady of Charity is, is rather unique because of three things. One, she is holding the cross, which is the image of our salvation, the symbol of our salvation. She is holding the baby Jesus in her hand. And Jesus is, of course, our Savior. But the other part is the title. She specifically gave us that title. Nobody else came up with it. I am the Virgin of Charity. I am the Virgin of Love. One of the dangers of, and one of the realities too, of the Cuban Revolution has been the division. The division between the Cubans in Cuba, those who are in agreement with the government, and those who disagree. The division between those who stay on the island and those who, of us who have had to leave in exile, the division of the ideologies. One of the things I was taught as a child early on was that communism always brings about hatred and division. And that hatred and that division are deadly. They're anti-Christian. And I've seen it. I've seen that division. I've seen that hatred. When people have been subjugated, when they have had everything stolen from them, when they've been persecuted, when they've had to suffer, you know, that brings about great resentment. And one of the dangers that I saw when I worked at the Shrine of Our Lady of Charity in Miami was so many people there who arrived, some of them were recent arrivals, literally coming off rafts off the, uh, off the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, and they would come uh, on shore. Oftentimes, we would find these rafts that would appear that were empty. You'd find articles of clothing that were left behind, some of them bloody because they had been uh, attacked by sharks out in the sea. It's still happening today. When you see things like that, it can cause bitterness and hatred. And one of the things I would tell people all the time was, be very careful that because of your experience, the experience that all of us have had, because I've suffered from it myself, we do not become bitter. And we never hate our enemies. We pray for them. We pray for their conversion. And I always remind them, remember, that our patroness is the virgin of charity, the virgin of love, opposite of hatred. Our Lord taught us to love. God is love. So perhaps more than any other culture, any other country, she came specifically to tell us during the times of persecution, during the times of difficulty, during the times in which we are overbeaten with waves of hatred and division. Remember me, I am the virgin of charity. I am the virgin of love. I am the one who will bring you together. That's really the message of Our Lady of Charity. We see it even with the three boys that discovered her. You have young men of different races. Some of those races were against others. The black race was subjugated. The Indians were almost entirely wiped out in Cuba. And there was resentment and hatred among those races. But once again, we see Our Lady bring them all together. She did not ask who was white, who was black, who was brown. She simply wanted them to know that they are her children. And that's really the message I would like to leave with you. Our Lady of Charity is the mother of love. She is the one who brings us together. She brings races together. She brings peoples together. She brings even ideologies together. No matter what the waves of storms that we may face, that is the message of Our Lady. I am the Virgin of Love. I am the Virgin of Charity. Love one another. Thank you very much. And I hope that you learned something today. If you'd like to learn more, please uh, stop by the website of Our Lady of Charity in Miami. It's a wealth of information there.
Father Marcos, that was so good. Um, and, I, you know, the last part where you were talking about the unity component, I know that's been something that Pope Francis has been preaching a lot about recently, uh, unifying the church, bringing, bringing ourselves as a church together. Um, so I, I think that's really powerful. Um, there was one question. There's a few people who are on, and I, I asked if they had questions for you. And one of the folks asked the question, are there any qualities, um, super, supernatural qualities, similar to Our Lady of Guadalupe Tilma that can also be found with Our Lady of Charity? That's a very good question. The Tilma is extraordinary because it has all these symbols and so forth in it. Most of these other images of Our Lady, the only thing that makes them uh, miraculous is the fact that they're still around. Because most images of, of, of what they're made of is just the tiniest of, the simplest of material. And yet they're still there 400 years later. So that's what really makes them miraculous. It, but we focus not so much on the physical reality. That's important, but we focus on the message. Mm. And you know, it's interesting, you just reminded me of something. Cuba has had the privilege that even in the midst of the suffering under communism, we've had three popes, three consecutive popes that have visited Cuba. That hasn't happened in too many countries in the world. And it began with Pope John Paul II in 1998. I was only ordained a priest four years at that time. I desperately wanted to go. And I asked for permission from the Cuban government to go, and it was flatly refused. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to go. I had to watch it on TV. Makes me emotional to think about it. Because watching this was incredible to see the Pope in the middle of this island that had been so um, just secularized by communism was so powerful. And the way the people greeted him was incredible. Mm -hmm. Just the, the, the outpouring of love and devotion, it's beautiful. But he crowned once again, Our Lady of Charity in Oriente, in, in El Cobre. And then he told them, he told them, remember what she is. She is the Virgin of Love. Now, Pope Benedict XVI was the next one who went. And interestingly, he went the year in which he resigned in 2013, right, that was his last trip. And right after he came back to Rome, he realized, you know, this is a very exhausting thing. He, he felt he couldn't do it anymore. And so it was then that he uh, resigned from the papacy. I was there for that visit. And interestingly, I went back to Cuba for the first time in 2001. They had denied me for throughout 1998 during the people visit. And in 99, 2000, and finally 2001, out of, out of the blue, they said, okay, they let me go back. So I went back and I've been going back every year. In fact, I'll be there in January again. And then Pope Francis, in the first year of his papacy, he went, I think it was the first year, maybe the second, he went there as well, but in a very brief visit that, um, that was once again to bring about devotion in Cuba. In fact, he went twice. He also went a second time when he met with the Orthodox Patriarch and the, and the reunion took place right at the Havana airport. So we've had actually four papal visits, which is astounding when you think about it. Wow. Well, and this kind of feeds into the next question that somebody asked actually about what's her influence in, in present day Cuba um, and has communism changed her influence? I think the first question kind of when you were talking about the papal visits that are recent, it sounds like the spirit, she like the spirit's alive, like and well, people are, yeah, yeah, but would love to hear more yeah, thoughts on that. You know, when, one of the things that happened during uh, the communism in Cuba has shifted and, and sifted over the years. When I was a child, as I said, the churches were closed. We had no worship of any sort and so forth. There was one, one procession that was basically a spontaneous. They couldn't stop it. Each year was to the Shrine of St. Lazarus. That was one. The other was to the Shrine of Our Lady of Charity. Of course, that was on the opposite side of the island for me. So I was not aware of that. But they could never stop those. Now, in modern times, after the visit of Pope John Paul II, things shifted. First, Christmas was legalized. You mm -hmm. couldn't celebrate Christmas before. Now, all of a sudden, you could celebrate Christmas. Good Friday became a holiday as well. So those two came back. Also, they started to leave a little bit of freedom to the church. So people started to come back to church. Now, the devotion to Our Lady was always there, but it was kind of hidden. Now it could be out in the open. Small processions began to be allowed. So, for example, in my own town, but the first year I went back, it was kind of a funny thing. I went back in 2001. I hadn't been there in 30 years. So one of my aunts lives close to the cemetery and I wanted to visit all my relatives who had died in those 30 years, bless their graves. So I went in, down the street, all my relatives went with me and I was disguised in my usual disguise of a black cassock walking down. All of a sudden a little motorcycle policeman comes by and says, screams at me, you can't be leading processions. I said, I'm not leading a procession. I'm walking to the cemetery. My relatives are walking behind me. 
what procession? So he leaves me alone. So, but it was interesting that first visit, I had two spies on me the entire time. Uh, whenever I went, whatever mass I celebrated, they would listen carefully to see if I was gonna give any political uh, speeches. And of course I never did, that's not my purpose then. After that, they pretty much have left me alone and I've been back now 21, uh, for 21 years. So now when I go back, you see, first off, masses on Sundays are well attended. Hmm. In, a, in a parish like my own, my hometown, it's a town of about 25,000 people. Maybe 300 people go to church. That's tiny. But if you go back 20 some years ago, you might've had 10 people go to church. So a great amount of progress has been made. Catechesis now is permitted. So for example, on Sunday mornings after mass, they all go over to the priest's house where there's a big backyard and that they break them into little classes. And so they all have catechism classes. Most of the catechisms they use are ones that I brought over the years because there's no printing or religious materials there. So they have a very hard time getting them. But at least the faith is being, is being uh, passed on. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon though. You have various generations. My parents' generation still had the faith from before the revolution. My generation had nothing. We were brought up with nothing and my generation's after us. So I'm, I'm considered part of the either late baby boom or early Gen X. That, those generations had nothing. Then you have the newer generations. And now these kids, the little kids are better catechized. They actually go home and teach their parents about the faith. The parents know nothing. They've not received any of the sacraments. So you have people who are not married in the church, who have never had their first communion or confirmation, but whose children now are baptized and receiving first communion and confirmation. And slowly the parents are making their way back. My own cousins of my age and a little bit younger are those ones that our generations didn't have any, any religious instruction. So I've had to bit by bit evangelize them over and over. So it's, it's, it's a shifting. Yeah, it's incredible to see the power of the Holy Spirit move and, and revitalize a country um, spiritually, um, because that's, that's something that's, that's going to be really beneficial for the future of, of the church. Um, uh, so there's another question that came in from somebody. How does Our Lady bridge the divide between those in Cuba and those outside Cuba? Is, is it unconditional love she represents regardless of ideology? Absolutely. You know, our Lord did not come for one particular group or one particular race or one particular ethnicity or ideology. He came for the salvation of all, all those who accept him. And our Blessed Mother is the same. She loves all her children. So a very interesting thing is that Our Lady of Charity is the one who is in Cuba. She's also in Miami. She's in everywhere that it, I don't know of any Cuban home that doesn't have her image somewhere. And interestingly, the, the, uh, the motto of the Cuban Catholics in Los Angeles is La Caridad Nos Une, mm -hmm. meaning charity unites us. And they're speaking, speaking referring to especially there, Our Lady of Charity. Our Lady of Charity unites us. Remember, communism divides. Ideology divides. Hatred divides. Love and faith, our Blessed Mother unites and brings us together. And that's exactly what she's still doing. How has it affected your faith, like her, your devotion to her? You know, um, I have to be honest, I had devotion to Mary before I had devotion to Our Lady of Charity. Mm -hmm. Only because even though I knew her there, I didn't know the story. So once I came here as a child, the Mary that I grew up with was Our Lady of Grace, which is a statue of my parish church growing up. But it was later as I got to know more of my own culture. And I would see the, the, the little, we always had a statue of Our Lady of Charity in my mother's uh, bedroom. And so I started to dig more into it. And the, I, the more I did, the more I fell in love with her. Hmm. And another, on a whole, whole other level. Because not only do I love her as Mary, the mother of, of God, the mother of Jesus, but now I love her specifically because she came to the land in which I was born. And I realized she has been, I've been under her protection this entire time. Yeah, that's, that's really but powerful. My ordination holy card was Our Lady of Charity. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I love that. I love that. Uh, and I, I, I think the reason I love her so much is because she desires to bring people together of, of all, of all backgrounds. Um, cause it's so needed in our church, in our world. Um, so it, it's just very, very powerful. Um, well, thank you again, Father Marcos, really, really grateful for the conversation today. And for everyone who's online, um, next week we'll be having the renowned professor Timothy Maravina from Notre Dame University come to speak about Our Lady of Guadalupe on the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It'll be at 6 p.m. 
Pacific Standard Time. So definitely tune in then. We will have a text message also sent out for all of our members so that people know to tune in. Um, again, thank you for everybody who tuned in. If you'd like more content like this, please uh, consider joining the Catholic Association for Latino as a member. For more information on that, uh, please contact administration at callsa.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a blessed Advent, and we'll see you next week. God bless. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.